Hello everyone, this is Angie Hoshold, and today we're going to be talking about retrieval and emergency services in confined spaces. We're going to take a look at the OSHA standard 19.1910.146, 1926.1211. We're going to take a look at what a confined space is. We're going to review some of the dangers in a confined space, and we're also going to look at some of the requirements for the rescue and some of the rescue equipment. Now, in order to actually understand what rescue from a confined space is, you should be familiar with what is a confined space. And this is a place that is substantially, although not always entirely, enclosed where there's a risk of danger of serious injury from either hazardous materials or dangerous conditions such as lack of oxygen. Um, doesn't have to only be one opening to be a confined space. You can have multiple openings to be considered a confined space if the worker has to crawl under or over various obstructions to get to the opening and to get out. Now, confined spaces um, are accountable for about 90 deaths a year. Um, according to OSHA, about two-thirds of these deaths are actually workers that are killed while trying to rescue someone else from the confined space. This is often due to just poorly planned retrieval attempts or untrained personnel trying to do the rescue themselves. Some of the dangers that you will see, lack of oxygen, fire and explosions, um, poor visibility, you can't see what you're working on, po poisonous gases, fumes, um, and then very often injuries and deaths occur as a result of the actual work that's being carried carried out in the confined space, work like welding or painting, flame cutting, and then using other chemicals. Now the OSHA standard 1910.146 addresses retrieval and rescue services within the general industry. Now in 2015, OSHA designed a confined space standard specifically for construction workers since they are subjected to confined spaces during a good bit of their operations. These two standards are very similar to each other, so we're going to discuss both and then I'm just going to bring out a few of the small differences. Now any workplace that contains um, uh, permit spaces, they must post danger signs um, in order for the employees to be aware of the danger. These are just a few examples of the types of signs that you may see. Affected employees are the ones that are going into the confined space or designated for rescue operations. They've got to be provided with appropriate PPE and training to include CPR and basic first aid. There has to be at least one person with CPR and first aid training always available on site. They are required to practice their rescue duties at least once every 12 months by means of simulated, um, uh, simulated rescue from either the actual permit space or from a representative permit space. And these spaces must have similar opening size, configuration, and accessibility as the actual rescue site itself. Now one difference here you'll notice in the construction standard, it says that this has to be practiced before attempting any actual rescue. Rescue teams have to be selected that are equipped and proficient in performing the required rescue service. Um, and this implies to whether they are in-house or they're a third party. They have to have the capability to reach a victim within a timely manner. And OSHA says a timely manner will vary depending upon the specific hazards involved in each injury and what is appropriate for the permit space hazards that have been identified. They have to let the employee know if their services become unavailable. They have to be informed of any hazards that they're going to get into once they enter the rescue site. They have to be provided access to the permit space prior to so that they can develop their rescue plans and practice their rescue operations. The MSDS sheets for any chemicals that the entrants could be exposed to are required to be kept on the work site and they also should be available for any medical facility um, if first aid has to be rendered. Now OSHA has this non-mandatory appendix F in here and this appendix actually provides guidance to employers in choosing an appropriate rescue service. It contains criteria that may be used to evaluate the capabilities both of prospective and current rescue teams. Now there are three types of rescue techniques. The non-entry, entry by others, entry by trained employees. Now the non-entry rescue, that's conducted without entry into the actual space itself. This is the preferred and the safest means of confined space retrieval. Um, entry by others, um, the company can actually hire a third-party rescue service to conduct emergency rescues or municipal emergency responders. 
like a local fire department, for instance. Um, they can also, some companies will actually train their employees um, on site to perform their rescue services. Now, if the rescue requires entry, it is important to note that any rescuer should never go into a confined space to attempt rescue without the proper training or equipment. Otherwise, they're just likely to become a victim themselves. Now, any authorized entrant, um, if they go into the permit space, they have to have on a chest or a full body harness with a retrieval line. Um, and you can also use wristlets or here the construction says you can add anklets that's not in the general industry standard may be used in lieu of this full body harness if the employer can prove that it is the safest and most effective alternative um, the other end of the retrieval line has to be attached to a mechanical device or a fixed point that's outside of the permit space so that if a rescue becomes inevitable it can begin immediately a mechanical vice must have to be available to retrieve the person in from a vertical position if it's more than five feet deep. Now the construction standard here specifies that equipment that can become tangled or can or will not work because of the figuration of the space cannot be used. Now how do you pick appropriate rescue equipment? ANSI actually writes the standards to include all the harnesses, the carabiners, lanyards, connectors, ropes, um, all the equipment is written by ANSI. The manufacturers will actually design their products and test them in accordance with the ANSI standard Z359. Now if the confined space requires vertical entry and there's not a fixed ladder in the site, then you'll need fall protection. Now this fall protection equipment will also serve as rescue equipment when retrieval is required. Um, there's three main components here. You've got to have a proper anchorage, a body support, and a connector. Um, OSHA says that after taking the maximum allowable free fall of six feet, that a person must not fall or they must be stopped within three and a half feet. And the systems have to be rigged such that an employee can neither free fall more than six feet nor contact any lower angle level. Any anch an anchorage point must be capable of supporting 5,000 pounds per attached worker and it has to be capable of supporting the required arresting forces. Now this is the force that's actually put on the body. An anchorage for workers fall arrest equipment must be independent of any anchorage used to support or suspend platforms. That way if the platform falls the employees do not fall. Connectors must be made from steel or equivalent materials and they have to have a corrosion resistant finish and the edges have to be smooth. Now there are specialized harnesses available for confined space entry and retrieval. The uh, maximum fall arresting force that can be transmitted to the body of a worker through this harness is 1800 pounds of force. Now that sounds like a lot but however this force is actually distributed over a large area of the body by the harness straps. That's why the straps are passed through the worker's legs and the harness is designed so that most of the force is passed um, onto the worker's buttocks or thighs, as well as some force to the shoulders, chest, and weight, so it's equally distributed. Now these harnesses have D-rings at the top of both shoulder straps, and the D-rings and the snack hooks, they have to have a minimum tensile strength of 5,000 pounds. Now the tensile strength of a material is the maximum amount of tensile stress that it can be subjected to before failure or before it breaks. A device called a wide lanyard connects to these two D-rings to the winch line so that the employee can be raised and lowered in a fully vertical position. The most common type of shock absorber has a webbing woven or stitched together and then these pieces of webbing rip apart or the stitches rip out in a fall, therefore absorbing a lot of the excess force. Again, all of these components are designed according to the ANSI standards. Now this is an example of the wristlets that we discussed earlier. Um, you can see in, in the pictures here how it's, they're actually used. Anklets would prove a little bit more effective, I think, in a horizontal situation or like a vertical ascent versus a descent. 
Self-retracting lifelines or lanyard is a specific kind of a lanyard that's used with a safety harness and it, 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 it utilizes inertia to activate a braking mechanism that is part of a, a block unit that's housed inside this body of the lanyard. And this mechanism is typically activated when the fall distance exceeds uh, four and a half feet per second. Tripods are easily set up by one worker and they can be easily transported from one location to another. Uh, one limitation of the tripod though is the size of the opening that it can actually accommodate. If more versatility is needed, a davit arm or davit post may be a better option. They offer adjustable and fixed bases and they can be used on various types of job sites. If a horizontal entry with a vertical positioning or retrieval is required, for example, if you've got to go into the side, the opening on the side of a tank, then a side entry system would be needed. Now this type of system clamps or bolts to the access point to provide an anchorage and then uh, and the base for attaching. That's where you would attach your winch mechanism. And then a winch um, or a winch power drive, including a steel or synthetic line and crank, um, is to release or rewind the line, connects to the tripod or to the davit system, whichever you're using, to help lower and raise the employee. And the benefits are one employee can operate it, and if something happens they can, and they happen to let go, then the person on the other end will not fall. And that is the end of today's presentation. I hope you found it informative, and I thank you for your time.